fifth and drugs was 33rd. I like that. So this next young man, uh, Olympic rower, then moved into road racing as a uh, riding on Team Cannondale and a number of other teams rode in the Vuelta, rode in the Giro d'Italia, decided to get into triathlon, and this last year won Ironman Wales. And in Kona, broke the bike course record in his first time there as a pro with a 412. Please give it up for Mr. Cameron Wirth. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing, bud? It's not a bad crowd, huh? Wasn't really expecting this. So thanks Say. everyone for coming. Hopefully I make it worth your while. I love well, that. Will, otherwise. So first of all, what was your what was your workout today up in LA? You know, your typical workout. Yeah, well, um, I've got one of the, so I work with Team Sky, uh, and Tim Kerrison is my coach, and uh, he's in charge of performance at Team Sky. So uh, I've been telling the guys how great it is in LA all year, so Geron Thomas decided to come out, and we're uh, doing a little camp here. It's just G and I and, um, and Tim. Um, and so we uh, had a, you know, a, a, a time trial effort today, and it was meant to be sort of two hours, but Tim decided just to be fair, because I'm a triathlete, that we make it 90 kilometres. So G decided to turn that into two hours. So we did the, the 90k in two hours, 45k an hour up and down the PCH. And then, um, <laughs> and then uh, being the triathlete, I had to go for a run. Tim wanted me to do a, a 25k run. So um, off the bike, I, I did that. And uh, yeah, so, and so it was a pretty wait, solid how, day. <laughs> how, how fast did you run for the 25K? It's basically a half marathon. Yeah, uh, so I was one hour 38, so pretty quick. Yeah. That's not bad. Yeah, so I've been working pretty hard on my run, obviously, since Kona and, um, and, and the swim. Uh, and, and my bike has actually got better too. So, um, yeah, now I'm in pretty good shape. And, you know, it's just sort of the start of the year and uh, start building up for October. Well, now, what was the wattage you were pushing during the ride today? So for that two hours, I reached uh, 360 watts. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah typical. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we do on a regular basis. It's not a big deal. So where'd you grow up? So I grew up on a little island, um, Lord Howe Island. It's, um, you draw a triangle from uh, uh, Brisbane, you know, Lord Howe Island and, and Sydney. So it's actually sort of on the way back to Australia from here. Um, yeah, it's 10 miles long and half a mile wide and 300 people live there. So um, it's a perfect breeding ground for, for triathletes. <laughs> and Tim Reed. Yeah, one of the top triathletes in the world who won the 2016 70.3 World Championships. He grew up there too. Yeah, he did. So we went to school together. Tim's a year, year younger than me. So we had one, you know, it goes sort of kinder to grade, grade two and then three to six. So we got split up there for one year. I was in grade three and he was in two. But um, apart from that, we went, went through the whole way together and uh, fierce rivals, uh, of course, through through school with all, you know, sort of four people in your age group. And, um, yeah, but uh, our destiny obviously awaited us, you know, in Kona. We finally had our showdown. And, um, yeah, it was a bit disappointing to see him on the side of the road with a flat tyre uh, when we went past. But, um, but, yeah, I mean, he's a little man and he's... You know, he's uh, certainly going to come back with a vengeance next year. So, but you guys raced a triathlon when you were kids. Yeah, we did. They had an annual, an annual triathlon when we were sort of, you know, finally old enough to, uh, to do it. I, I, I don't know, I think we were eight or nine or something, the first one. And um, he had to swim in. There's like a little island in the lagoon called Rabbit Island. And it looks like it's about, I mean, when you're that age, you think it's about 4K. Uh, it's about 200 metres. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, we, we went, went stroke for stroke, you know, in the swim, absolute ding-dong battle. And I've always been a natural on the bike, Bob, so I actually, you know, got on the bike and got a bit of a gap. But What type of bike? I'd borrowed my grandfather's 10-speed uh, race bike. What was uh, Tim on? Tim was on his father's 10-speed uh, mountain bike, uh, which was both way too big for us. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I've, yeah, again, I, I showed my, um, my knowledge. You know, I went for a race bike, he went for a mountain bike, so I had a nice little gap, but it all sort of came a bit unraveled and my chain, uh, chain got jammed, so I'm rolling along and, uh, you know, I could look him back and I could see Tim coming and I had a, you know, I had to, still had probably, you know, four or five hundred metres to go and 
had to make a really quick decision whether I, um, you know, hopefully roll and push the bike or I ditch the bike and steal one. So, um, you know, at eight years old, you do what, you know, is logical and you dropped it and stole one. And, um, Wait, so there was another bike just laying there? It was. It was at one of the <laughs> guest houses just uh, on the side of the road. And, uh, yeah, I remember it. It was pink and white. Uh, Tim remembers it too. Had a basket on the front, uh, single speed. Uh, so it was a bit of a downgrade. I couldn't sit on the seat. It was way too big. So lucky it was a female one. So it had like a step through. So I was, you know, out of the saddle. And, yeah, we got off and, uh, you know, ran together against shoulder to shoulder. It was a bit like the Iron War, probably, you know, a bit more famous at the time. I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how people don't know about it, but, yeah, and then, yeah, it must have been the last couple hundred metres that, oh God, it was probably the most, still the most humiliating sporting defeat of my life, watching this thing that, like, waddles like a duck, like with his legs, how he sort of dangles them out and... He's still got the same technique today, but it works for him, and um, yeah, he... He beat you. He pipped me, yeah. He beat you. Yeah. So, when did rowing come into your life? Uh, so, that was when, uh, so, uh, 13 or 12, so high school, moved back to, um, to Tasmania, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I did every sport as a kid, um, and um, going around the tables, you know, for summer sports, and saw rowing, and thought, yeah, why not... Mum had always told me I'd be a great role one day. She said I had a long back. Um, I don't know, you know, how she had that idea, but she'd told me since I, I can remember, since I was, you know, tiny. And so I thought I'll give it a go. And, yeah, I went down the first morning. I was so excited about this rowing business. And um, being the small guy, they stuck me in the coxswain seat. And um, that was where I stayed for about three years. Uh, I so you didn't up. have to row, you just yelled. Yeah, I rocked up every morning with my gear, with my rowing suit, ready to jump in and row. And uh, every morning they just put me in the coxswain seat. So that was a bit tough. And I'd go home and I'd train on the rowing machine and I'd go to the gym every day. And I just tried so hard just to get a chance. And, you know, because you're small, you just don't get a chance. And anyway, finally I did get a chance and, you know... You went all right. You went all right. So what was that Olympic experience like? Yeah, I mean, it was a dream. As a kid, um, you know, growing up, I uh, just wanted to go to the Olympics, and, and rowing happened to be the sport that I was best at that was an Olympic sport. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I remember, you know, to be honest, like, I, I was so fixated on making the team that, you know, uh, that was the biggest challenge. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> and, uh, and also, I was only so young, like, no one expected me to make it, um, just myself. And uh, so, you know, being, and then, and then sort of being there, and, you know, the year before, we'd, we'd won the Under-23 World Championship, so, I mean, we were, I guess, you know, on the progression, but just really got blown away by the fact, I mean, rowing, it's a bit like Kona, really, in triathlon, I mean, it's just a completely different level, you know. I mean, everyone knows it's the biggest event, and so that's everyone steps up for it. And um, you know, you can win a world championship, and you go to the Olympics, and you got to, you know, go to another level. And and we were capable, but we just weren't ready for it, and uh, got blown away early. So it was a pretty tough experience because in one minute you're excited because you're at the Olympics, but then sort of when it's all over, and you know, you've missed out on a chance to win a medal you um, realise, wow, like, I've got to wait four years for another crack. So, um, anyway, I, I got over that pretty quick uh, when I found the Heineken house um, that <laughs> for the second week and, um, you know, I became pretty good friends with some Sports Illustrated models and um, you know, I had a great second week of the Olympics, Bob. I mean, I was... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I may not have been had the gold medals of Michael Phelps, but I was probably better known than him in the party scene over there, that's ah. for sure. Yeah. And did you want to hang out for 2008 and go back to another Heineken house, or what were you thinking? <laughs> well, the one, the one thing I did say to myself after that is I'd never buy McDonald's ever again. I almost turned myself into a chicken McNugget in that second week, because there was McDonald's in the village and it was free. So um, <laughs> I sort of was pretty you know, determined to get back to the games, because I, I said I'd you know, never pay for it again. I'll only ever eat that at the Olympics. But... Um, yeah, it was, and and I know I went on, and the ne you know the next uh, to 2006 we were I went back to, I went back to school the year after that and or college, and I'd, I'd sort of been doing it and kept chipping away at my economics degree. And 2004, six we were fourth at the worlds, but I just I realised like I didn't actually really like rowing. I just wanted to go to the Olympics, and um, <laughs> so I was just sort of rowing up and down, backwards and forwards, and yeah, yeah, no, it just wasn't there for me, and. 
I fortunately had tendonitis in my wrist, uh, so had to have a bit of time out of the boat after the World Championships in 06, and uh, focus on the bike for a few months, and yeah, it was due to go back to rowing to a, to a camp, but the weekend before that was the National Championship, so I decided I may as well enter in the professional, like the time trial. Um, since you're there, and you've well, been, I, since you've been cycling for how long? Three months. Yeah, yeah. and um, might as well go to World Championships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> national championships. Uh, that's a yeah. natural progression. So, I, think. Yeah. I thought it was. I mean, that was my <laughs> logic anyway. So um, I did that and ended up coming fourth. Uh, and Australia is pretty strong in that discipline. So you know, instantly the national team said, "Well, God, do you want to change sports?" And I said, "Well, will you give me a chance to make the Olympics?" And they said. Absolutely, sort of laughing behind your back, and um, I was like, "Great, I'm in." Yeah, so um, free McDonald's. Yeah, exactly. So let's do it. So Get some uh, more. McNuggets everywhere. Yeah, so I, I sort of read the selection policy and. I knew that uh, to get in the shadow squad, which I was already in for rowing, having been in the national team, you know, six and previous Olympian, uh, you needed to make the national team. And so I was like, wow, this is 2007. I've got to be in it this year to make the squad for next year. So, yeah, they, you know, when they, when I said to them I wanted to make it, I think the selectors, their exact wording was, Get your heads out, get your head out of the clouds. Um, and I said, "Yeah, okay. Well, just tell me what I got to do. Like, give me a race or something." Like, and they said, "Okay, if you really think you can do it, go and win this race in France. It was a, a one-day time trial. That, you know, um, historically the the winner of the under-23 World Championships had, had won each year and then won worlds. And um, we'll give you a spot in the national team. It was two weeks before the the, the uh, worlds." I won by point, point three of a second. So, so I went to the went to the worlds and um, you're, you're such an underachiever. That's a well, you give me give me a challenge and I'll uh, yeah, I generally am able to pull it off. So um, so that was that. So I was in the squad then and uh, yeah, and I actually made it. I was a reserve, so it's only five riders for the Olympics and um, I did the final camp with the guys and Cadell Evans had been at the tour that year and he was dancing after he came second, I don't know why, he shouldn't have been, but um, he uh, ended up sort of jarring it and they thought he'd you know, done some damage and um, anyway, so they had me there and it was literally like, Cadell, are you going to the airport or not? And he decided, yeah, I'm going to go and I missed out, so um, oh. it was that close to going sort of the consecutive Olympics in two different sports, which would have been pretty cool. Uh, so... Then I had to then focus on just trying to have a career in cycling. So, um, so and that's a little different gig because then you have to start doing. I mean, that's a lot of training, right? Or a lot of riding. Yeah, I mean, I, I've always trained. I, that, that part didn't phase me too much. Is understanding the the sport. You know, you have to learn another language. You've either got to learn French or Italian or Spanish or something. And um, you know, I was working on Italian and, you know, had another year racing amateurs and then uh, signed, my, you know, as a pro in uh, 2010. And as a pro, a pro cyclist, again, there's 365 days a year. How many days are you on the bike? Uh, most of them. Yeah, there's not many that you're not. Um, I mean, at least three, 330, 340. Yeah, oh, for sure. Uh, I mean, particularly early on when you you know, you're trying to make it and, you know, in hindsight, it's probably one thing that might have got burnt me out on that sport a little bit, just sort of more mentally than anything is you don't like taking a day off and there's probably years where I might have only had a few days off the bike or maybe a week. Um, whereas sort of more recently, you know, I'll happily take a day off and uh, that's what I've actually started doing well. So, um, yeah, good lesson out there. You know, always take a day off if you can. So you race in the Giro d'Italia. Uh, 2013 and the Vuelta, those those uh, the, those ri the tours. How brutal are they when you're riding every day at, with the the greatest talent in the world? Oh, I mean, if you train well enough, it's it's no different to three weeks of hard training, really. I mean, everyone gets tired, so you know the racing's not you know that crazy. It's 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 the other bits and pieces around the Grand Tour that tire you out. You know, packing your bag, unpacking your bag. You know getting to bed late, finishing stages late, the media, the fans, um, pressure of the, you know, the team, if the team's not performing to get results. I mean, it's more the sort of subconscious psychological draining bits and pieces that affect you more than the physical, if right. that makes sense. So, um, you know, you see the best guys like a Vincenzo Nibali, and I was teammates with him for quite a few years, and 
you just every time you turn around, if there's nothing happening, the guy's asleep. Like it doesn't matter where you are, like he's just asleep. Like in the hotel lobby, on the team bus, the team car, on the start line, like wherever. You know, he's sound asleep. And um <laughs> You so know, you grab your sleep whenever you can. Yeah, he just doesn't waste any energy. You know, he just switches off at any opportunity. And, you know, he's probably the most, you know, of, of course, Froomey's been phenomenal in the tour the past, you know, years. But Vincenzo's Grand Tour record is phenomenal since the age of 19. I don't think he's ever finished outside the top 10, you know, in 15 starts or something. And he's won all of them as well, right. uh, which is something, you know, no one currently has done. So that's that's really... The, you know, the, the biggest thing, I mean, <laughs> racing, you know, day in, day out, it, it has the same, you know, it's not like everyone's superhuman all of a sudden and can just ride flat out for three weeks, you know, people get tired and so there's there's actually a lot of really boring days out there, like I really bet. boring, <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it certainly gives you a different uh, edge and, I mean, 13, for example, I did two, grand, I did the Giro and then the Vuelta and um, you certainly you know, have a different sort of uh, perspective on backing up your training after doing something like that. So, so when, you're, when you go to those, when you go to triathlon, you're there to win, right? When you're a part of a team, you have a role. And what was your role as part of the team? Yeah, I mean, initially you, you go there and um, I was a support rider. We had, you know, Peter Sagan and uh, Ivan Basso and Nibali. So, you know, there some pretty big leaders there. And, and I just sort of rode, particularly in support of um, of Basso. I was, you know, sort of assigned to him uh, more than air. And so Pete. what do you, when you're a support, what do you do? I mean, you just sort of put, try and make sure they get to the position so they can win the race. So uh, be there with them as long as possible and protect them from the wind and keep them, you know, so they save as much energy as they can and, you know, make sure they got food. And, uh, you know, in Basso's case, if he needed a bike, give him a bike, you know, with the same size or give him a wheel or whatever. And just basically anything you can possibly do to, to put them, you know, in the, the crucial point of the race where it's won and lost and as fresh as possible to try and execute. So that's your whole role, you know. You're never, ever thinking about a result yourself. Um, was that ever. hard? Uh, not at first because it was, it was kind of what I wanted to do. Um, that was, you know, again, that that's sort of was my goal to, um, to, to actually race alongside Basso, like I, when I was rowing, uh, when we trained in Varese in Northern Italy, I, I saw him out training a couple of times. I was like, wow, that looks so much cooler than what I'm doing. And, um, <laughs> you know, his gear and his bike and his, you know, person following with drink bottles and this, yeah, a rowing boat and a dinghy just doesn't really, you know, cut it. Um, so... I, it was that was something that I wanted to do. I, I couldn't believe it when you know Liquid Gas was one of the teams that I had an opportunity to turn professional with, and um, so I I wanted that, you right. know. Um, and it wasn't until you know you, a few years, four or five years later, that you start. Yeah, I mean, I I just didn't want my life to. I I couldn't get myself out of that mold. Like I had some good success myself. But I'd always just slip back into a supportive role because it was probably easy. I mean, yeah. it was very easy. And I didn't want my, you know, most productive years of my life to be defined by just being there to help others. Oh, well, you know, I love doing things for other people, but being in that role. Sure. Uh, like, I felt like I had more, more to offer the world. And so I had, was with Cannondale. I still had a contract for the following year. And I just said, look, this is how I feel. I feel like I'm participating. Um, you know, I don't need to just, I don't really feel like, racing for the sake of getting paid, you know, and they said, well, you know, you're quite a good brand ambassador for us, so if, you, if, you, if you're keen to move to America and take a bit of a break and see if you want to continue, we'll honour your contract for a year and you can do some stuff for Cannondale. And paid vacation? Pretty much, yeah. Um, <laughs> I asked for a schedule of things to do and, uh, yeah, they just sent me a blank piece of paper, so um, I was left to my own devices, so... <laughs> Yeah, it was it was pretty cool. I mean, it's sort of like I guess you dream. You think you just got the year to do what you want, and initially it was. I had a ball and caught up on all the things I hadn't done, being a sportsman all my life. And but by about what well, was Oceanside, I was bored. It was, it was bat poo. And um, I said to Cannon, though, you know, like enter me in this triathlon thing. Like I'd I'd heard about it and. Uh, and so they said, oh, I wish you'd take something seriously and train. And I said, oh, no, I'm fine. Send to me. And so they did. And um, Whistler? No, no, this was Oceanside. Oh, it was okay. a half. Yeah. yeah. 
And uh, so I did that, and um, I actually did pretty well. And uh, as an age grouper, yeah, okay, yeah. So I guess I was the first age grouper. I guess, and I beat all the girls. Yeah, I oh, you beat that. all the girls. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. and um, because it was Heather Jackson, because she won. Yeah, and I remember just keeping an eye on her. Um, but um, <laughs> but yeah, so that was pretty cool. And then uh, after that, everyone was like, "Oh, okay, you know, you should do an Ironman." And I said, "No, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. I just needed something just to open the lungs and open up the body and." Do, I can't be bothered learning to swim and run. So, yeah, I went back to my having fun year and, you know, got to another cup through another couple of months of that. It was July and I was like, God, I'm bored, you know, nothing to wake up for. And So I said to Cannondale, I said, you know, like, what's the next Ironman? They said, Camp, seriously, like, train for one, do it properly. I said, no, just send me in the next one. So that was another two weeks down the road. And, um, well, wait, that was Whistler. Whistler. Yeah, so, so basically... You, had you done any swimming or running? No, no, no. Yeah, why waste your time no, with that? I can, no, no. I can understand that. Yeah, yeah that's that's <laughs> it's a sort of a drag on your time. Now, yeah. hadn't you done a, some charity ride with Lance? At yeah, that point? so I'd actually been in Aspen at that point, and I was with Lance at a charity event, and he he said to me, he said, "Look, mate, like it's pretty cool what you're doing. You know, a lot of people are talking about the fact that you just get to swan around and do nothing, and there's a lot of people envious in the bike bike industry, but." Just remember, you can do all this when you're when you're 50. You know, like you can have a ball when you're 50. So, don't waste time. Don't waste your talent. And that was when I sort of thought, you know, yeah, that's a really good point. What do I do? Do I go and work on Wall Street? Do I, you know, go back to cycling? Do I do some sport? And yeah, and that was when the idea of the Ironman came up. Not more from wasn't really thinking about a, you know, career in it. I was more thinking about a challenge. And um, and I also had been watching a lot of, I'd watched a lot of them on uh, on YouTube and all those stories and everything. And I, I met a guy called Bonner Paddock and he had cerebral palsy, he'd done Kona two years before and he finished and he broke 26 or 27, but I can't remember the exact number, but lots of bones in his body doing it. Yeah. And he still had two fractures two years later. And so I thought if I ever do an Ironman where I train, that's pretty disrespectful to someone like that. Like, as a, just a healthy individual, I should be able to get through one of these. And I honestly had no idea what I'd do. It would take me 16 hours, 10 hours, 8 hours. I had no idea. I mean, I hadn't trained. So I fronted up to Whistler, and um, yeah, it didn't actually take me that long at all. Um, so <laughs> that was good. What, what, what place did you finish? You were an age grouper, right? I was an age grouper, yeah, but I was ninth overall. And first age grouper. Yeah. Yeah. So that qualified you for Kona. Yeah, I've never enjoyed spending a thousand dollars more in my life. I like I couldn't believe how I ran up to that thing and like handed them my credit card and uh, yeah, got myself signed up for Kona. Like I was then I had such a ball that day. I mean, God, what an incredible experience doing an Ironman. I mean, the amount of stuff that goes on. I remember in the swim before I think. It, I'd worn a wetsuit in uh, Oceanside the first time, but this was the second time. And in the first time, I, I didn't know about the Vaseline thing, so I got some chafing. So this time, I did not leave anything to chance. I ate everything. And um, <laughs> right before the start, and all over the body. And then I grabbed the goggles, and I jumped in. I put them on, and I jumped in. And I was thinking, God, I can't really see that much here. Anyway, I thought, oh, it must be just foggy. Anyway, so I gave him a quick wipe again and went out to the start. Gun went off, off I went. I'm like, I can't see. And I kept swimming, kept swimming, kept swimming. After a bit, I'm thinking, there's no one bumping into me. And I sort of wake up, look up, and sort of lift up my goggles. And yeah, everyone's way over there somewhere. Anyway, put them back on and keep going. I was like, they're going to clear at some point. And then I realized, it sort of dawned on me, that there was Vaseline all over my goggles. <laughs> so I was like, wait a minute, it's fresh water. So I ditched the goggles and did the swim without goggles. So that was quite an experience. Um, and, you know, and it was pretty motivating too because obviously I was dead donkey last and you know, <laughs> swam through a lot of people. So I thought I was way better than I actually was. And um, yeah, and then, and then getting on the bike was, was the next pretty funny thing because it's pelting with rain, like it's freezing. And you're getting the transition and... Everyone's like in a rush, and I'm I'm watching all these people like rushing to grab their helmets and grab everything and run out. And I'm thinking, they just wearing their tri suits. Are they nuts? Anyway, I have my raincoat and my gloves and my arm warmers. So I'm like just standing there getting dressed. I had a one of those Starbucks frappuccinos. Sort of drank one of them. 
got on the bike and I honestly it would have been within 10k there was like people stopped shivering and I was like well what do you expect I mean I, I'm pretty confident that I'm better than all of you on a bike and I'm cold so I don't know I don't know what's going on with the rest of you if I'm missing something here but sure enough I you know, just kept picking them off one by one and you know rode you know, I think you know 20 minutes out of the pros and um yeah, and got on the run and sort of just plotted through. So Had another then, Frappuccino and off I went. <laughs> so then you're coming over to Kona, but before you come to Kona, you're riding your mountain bike and break your foot? Yeah, so that was that was a bit annoying. I mean, the next week I had a mate in town and he wanted to go to this mountain bike festival and I was like, okay, you know, I'll have a week off before I start. Now I'm motivated. Now I want to actually train. I want to do well in Kona. You know, I'm thinking this will be cool and then, you know, then I have to think about what I want to do after that and... Cannondale's all excited and they're building a new bike for me and all this stuff and everyone's excited, you know. And uh, I go to this mountain bike festival and I'm fiddling around on my mountain bike pretending I'm Valentino Rossi going around a corner and, yeah, jag my foot on a tree branch and break three bones in my foot. So um, that was that. Yeah. But you came to corner. Yeah, so I figured, you know, I mean, I they put it in a cask and, you know, had all the therapy. I got it off about 10 days before, so I said to the doc, I can walk on it, can't I? He said, yeah, you can walk on it. I was like, oh, sweet. So I I felt that, you know, I probably deserved my other foot broken if I didn't go. I mean, what an opportunity. So I just went and, um, yeah, did the swim and did the bike and, yeah, I remember trying to, like, like, catching the women and I almost got to Daniela and I got, to, like, without 5k to go on the bike and I just completely, I mean, I hadn't done any training for months and almost got her and then just oh, blew up like a cheap watch and just watched her just sort of drift away and I was thinking, God, I hope that helicopter can't see this. Because <laughs> you, you were an age grouper, so you yeah. started, like, 25 minutes back of, yeah. the, of, the, of, the, of the pros. Of the, of the pros, pro women, yeah, yeah. pro women. So they put about 20 minutes into me in the swim and then I was, you know, slowly catching them. And, um, yeah, and then once I got on the run, well, I couldn't run. Uh, but, and, I, and it actually hurt to walk as well because all the crepitus and stuff because it's been not moving for so long. Um, so I kind of invented the sh like this shuffle. And uh, my only goal was to finish before the sun went down. You know, I, d I didn't want any glow sticks. I mean, they look cool, and like the people that wear them, I think that's great. But I didn't want glow sticks. <laughs> so, or chicken soup. Yeah, you know, I definitely that stuff, yeah. didn't want chicken soup. No chicken soup. soup. That's bad. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, I, I did this shuffle, and uh, yeah, ended up getting. It was actually pretty cool. Like all the pro women pass you, and you know, you sort of feel like you're in the race, and you see the front man, and yeah, it was great. And coming back, I was out on the Queen K before Jan finished probably about 3 or 4k and I, I saw him and you know I remember watching and thinking you know obviously amazing he just was winning his first Kona and, but I wasn't intimidated like I, I thought you know I reckon I can beat you and I mean pretty dumb like pretty arrogant and uh, God knows how I thought that but that was genuinely what I thought I watched him and I thought you know what I think I'm going to come back and have a pra pra proper crack at this I'm actually going to race this event and um, here we are so, in 16, were you sort of going back and forth, triathlon, cycling? Yeah, I, no, I, I was committed to, to, to... Now I'll try. ...to triathlon, but, um, you know, I was just dumb. Um, I had, you know, a good engine, so I could train pretty hard. So, running, I just, you know, ran and ran and ran, so I just tore my calf, and, you know, I couldn't walk. Right. So, um, I was on my bike. I really couldn't do anything for about three or four months, and... Um, yeah, so that was that. That sort of ruled out that year, and then towards the end of 2016, it was like, okay, look, this is this is it. I'm going to give it one crack. I'm going to go to Arizona. If I can't, you know, be in the sort of the front pack and get off the bike pretty quick, then I'm just going to scrap it. You know, I'm not even going to bother learning to to run. And so I ended up swimming in the front pack, and um, I went and started swimming with uh, with Jerry Rodriguez, Jerry Rodriguez at Tower, yeah. Tower 26, and yeah, swam front pack. It even surprised him, and uh, and then go off the bike first, um, and then uh, and I think I was like a, a couple of minutes quicker than Jan was when he broke the world record for that swim bike, and uh, and then again I just sort of cruised through, the, you know, got through the run and and finished the race, and I thought, well, you know. If I learn to run, I can I can probably do it right in this sport. So that's when I decided to give it a proper crack uh, last year.
And so this year, it was, it was almost like you're making up for lost time. How many, how many full Ironman did you do this year? Yeah, six. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's good coming off a torn calf to go out and do six Ironman races. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I sort of, I started to learn to run. I, I met with Dave Yule just before I got injured, and, and that was probably the worst thing because he got me running quite well quickly. And... But that was the worst thing because then I loved running all of a sudden and I just ran too much. Um, so I, I, I asked Dave how to teach me how to run. I didn't actually ask, I didn't ask him how I actually then get better in a long-term period. So that was probably a question then. But anyway, I at least now knew how to run. So I just started slowly, you know, and, and just sort of, you know, went slow and just gradually built it up and... You know, in, in, in uh, South Africa, my goal was to run a 3, 3.12. I ran 3.11. And then, you know, by Cairns, I was running 3.02, 3.03. And then by, by Sweden, I was running three hours. So, um, and you were second in Sweden, right? Second in Sweden, yeah. I mean, I needed... So the goal, you know, then I started working with Tim Kerrison last year. Like, I went to a camp with Chris um, in Australia in, in January last year. And we worked really well together. And... Um, went to quite a few camps with the team during the year and yeah I mean that Tim's idea was we'll race as much as possible um, and he said you just need to get you to Kona like we just need to qualify because we need to find out the data from that you know what goes on there and he said the first year of Team Sky Bradley Wiggins like was a disaster you know he was going great and then went to the tour and just bombed out and he said it was the best thing that ever could have happened for Team Sky so I was like, okay. So, you know, I, I just snuck in as the top 50 in the world. I was 49th ranked <laughs> at, the <end> of, <laughs> at the end of August. Again, I, you know, if I want to do something, generally I figure it out. And, um, and then, you know, it was, uh, I, was scared. I wanted to do Wales. And so afterwards I said to Tim, oh, I guess we skip that then and get ready for Kona. He said, no, you've done one good race. Go and do another one. So I went to Wales and won. That was um, the first win. Yeah, yeah. So I was glad I did that. And then, uh, yeah, then we had five weeks to get ready for, uh, for Kona. And on, you know, the difference between your typical Ironman race, Sweden, or a race like that, it's pretty small pack at the front for the swim, right? Yeah. You get to Kona, there's everybody. Yeah, for Dana, yeah. we got all the great swimmers. And you were planning to try to swim with the lead pack, right? Yeah, so in Wales, I'd actually swam with Harry Wiltshire. Like, we got out of the water together, and so it was a big the improvement. Last, the year before, he was first out in Kona. So, I was, you know, my swim had improved a lot. And in Kona, I just got told how it was a big front pack, and just relax, just get into it, you know, don't waste too much energy, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, stupidly, I listened. I mean, the reason I'd had good swims during the year is I'm pretty aggressive at the start, um, you know, both you know, um, race-wise and physically, and um, I always get in a good spot. And um, in Kona, I was just a bit of a blouse, you know. I sort of let people pass me, let people pass me, and we're sort of going along, and I realised, I was thinking, God, we're just not moving that quick here. And uh, I poked my head up, and um, sure enough, there was a gap, and I was, then I looked over and I saw Lionel, and I thought, oh, golly, good gosh, this is really isn't good. <laughs> And then I looked to the other side and I saw Sevi and I was like, oh, well, that's sort of okay that he's here at least. And um, I just thought, well, you know, you're going to have to do this a bit differently. So I just, I just stayed with them. And I, I mean, gosh, I've had some boring sessions in my life, but I've never been more bored than I was in that swim. That was... Oh, I nearly fell asleep. But we got... And we you swam, what, 52, 53? I don't even know. Yeah. I, just, I just know that I was constantly looking over my shoulder wondering where the lead women were. And because I was thinking, surely they're going to catch us. And as we got close to the, to the pier, I had a good look back. And I was like, no, I think we might be right. And then sure enough, I hit the beach. And next thing, this thing was up under my armpit. And I looked down, it was a red hat. And I was like, oh, God. And I, Lucy Charles made up five minutes. <laughs> I'm the man of pros. And so this, this is good. So I, again, I tried to get out of the way of the cameras so no one noticed. And um, <laughs> sort of ran up the, <laughs> up the thing. And yeah, so you, you get on the bike thinking you're going to be up the front and you know, making the race and all this. And now I'm not even leading the women's race. <laughs> Yeah, you know, they got on the bike before me. It took me a good few k to catch them too. Like they were gone, and uh, yeah. But anyway, um, I saw Sevi, and he said, "Oh, Mr. Worth." He said, "Just relax. Don't worry. We catch them. We stay together." I was like, "Okay, sweet. Let's do this." So, if you want three great cyclists 
to pick to be together, you and Lionel and Jan and uh, Sebi. Mm. That that. So did you guys chat? Did you work together? Yeah, Lionel didn't say a word. Um, he was Mr. Serious, but yeah, Sebi and I spoke a lot. Um, and it was great. I mean, to be honest, you know, I thought about just going and trying to, you know, catch them quickly or quicker and do my own thing. But I thought, well, I've never actually raced in a group ever. I mean, I've always been in the front of the pack and going in front of the bike and being on my own and, you know, and whatever. And so I thought this is a great opportunity to stay with people, you know, and... and um, so I just stayed with Sebi and, uh, and Lionel and, you know, I let them dictate the pace because I had no idea what was going on. I mean, I thought the race was over. Uh, yeah. but, but then again, Sebi had always made it back to the front. And I didn't actually take any notice of the time gap and I'm glad no one told me. I had no idea. It was, it was like seven, seven minutes or something. Huge. Yeah, yeah, huge. I mean, I think the most I've ever been behind in the swim is like, you know, Josh Amberg when he's gone ballistic in South Africa, maybe it was a minute and a half or something. And uh, so I was glad I didn't know. Um, but we caught them pretty early. I mean, we caught them before the climb to Howie. Right. Um, so Sebi knew what he was doing. So I just had to trust him and just thought, you know, just go along for the ride, pardon the pun. So here's your two-time defending champion, Jan Frodeno, and you catch up to him. And when you first saw him, what'd you think? Yeah, I, I, so we came to the front, and when I saw Jan, someone like opened a gap. Fortunately, I thought, oh, I might just slip in here and have a look. And I mean, he looked terrible. I mean, he was all over his bike. And to be honest, I didn't think it was him. I was like, is that? Yeah, you know, I didn't know if it was him or Boris Stein or some other big German. But um, yeah, he looked terrible. So I thought, oh, this is good. And um, <laughs> So I let him, you know, I noticed the wind was really knocking him around a lot and uh, so I waited till we got close to the turnaround. I'd already decided that, you know, I noticed the wind was really affecting these guys. So I'd already decided, well, I'm just going to drill it down the descent because it's easy, it's free speed, but it's hard to hold and control your bike. So, that'll, you know, yeah, so I'll just get a gap there and... But as I went past Jan, I just couldn't resist. I said, because I had a nice little 40 mil front wheel, because I knew about you know the wind, and I've done a lot of wind tunnel testing, and and know that you know the the biggest impact on controlling your bike is the front wheel. And um, I said to Jan, I said, "Hey mate, how's that front wheel working out for you?" And he looked at me with daggers, and it was. It was <laughs> The thing was, I, and, I, and I said, yeah, mate, it's blowing you around a bit. Man. I, you know, good luck. And um, <laughs> again, he didn't say a word, just death stared me. And, you know, I'd heard that Jan is quite a bully. You know, like he likes to control the race. He thinks he's a bit of a patron of the, of the you know, the, the field. And he's great. I mean, great athlete, great ambassador, all that thing. Don't get me wrong. But, you know, he does. He yells at people. He tells people off at pushing hard and, you know, racing not the way he wants the race done. I was like, well, that's not going to work with me, buddy. So, you know, I was purely fixated on making sure I demolished that guy. Like, I really, I really wanted to break him. And I wanted to do it psychologically and then physically. And um, so, yeah, I turned around and noticed him struggling even more. So I just took off. And I knew he'd take the bait. I knew he was not looking good, so I knew he was struggling, and I knew he'd take the bait and try and chase. And that's exactly what he did, and we all saw what happened. So You basically took the, uh, took the run out of it. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it was, you could see it coming a mile away. Um, so, yeah. I mean, it's, it's disappointing. Only, my only regret with all that is the fact that it wrecked my race. It wrecked probably, you know, Sebi's race. It wrecked Lionel's race. And, because uh, you guys went so hard. Because we ended up probably going, you know, quite hard, and and not sticking to any of our plans, I guess, really. Um, having said that, that was my plan on the bike. Where I came unraveled was, the, was what I did when I started the run. That was... And you, you, on the bike, you lost your nutrition somewhere? Your at salt? the start, going down Polani. So I had no food. Um, so that was a bit annoying. And I probably, didn't, <laughs> I probably didn't make the right decisions out on course. Like I just grabbed Coke, you know, when I started getting hungry. And that was after about, you know... 60k of the bike or 30 miles so I was drinking I drank a lot of coke that day I should have bought shares that morning and um and I thought about it and uh anyway yeah and so that was a bit annoying but it really in hindsight I mean I it wasn't what affected me I mean I got off the bike and I felt great. It was actually one of the easier bike leagues I'd done all year. Well, heart rate wise, what were you like, 150? 150. Yeah, yeah, which in Sweden when I ran three hours, I was 160. So yeah. I was actually quite comfortable and I felt great. 
Um, I don't know if anyone saw my dismount. It was pretty bloody good. I mean, if I was at the Olympics, like, carrying off that bike, it was funny, the day before in the pro briefing, they said to us, like, please take care when you get off the bike. You know, just, they're volunteers, like, don't throw your bike at them. And I was like, yeah, and I was thinking about that as I was coming in. But I sort of forgot as soon as I jumped off the bike, I just launched that thing <laughs> at someone, <laughs> hit the ground running. And uh, I think I took an extra, you know, 30, 45 seconds out of those guys through transition. Like, I was on a mission, but once I got on the run, and I, at that point I was convinced I'd win. Like, I felt amazing. I just you thought looked I, good. I just thought I need, to, I need to get on the bike, get on the run, I need to get some fuel into me, I need to just get calm. Let them come, stay close, you know, and Dave and I had spoken a lot about a strategy uh, running, you know, I just needed to get through the energy lab and just stay close and we knew I could, could run quick, you know, a 10k, it was certainly a, a quick 10k when everyone's tired and, and try and be there and, but I got on that run and I just started thinking, wait a minute, it's the, it's Kona, like just don't be stupid, it's hot and it's, you know, the hardest race and just, just be calm, just be smart and, and I started trying to slow down and trying to take it easy and, and just couldn't get in a rhythm and it just all went pear-shaped. You know, I, I should have just done exactly what I'd been doing on the bike and just gone for it. Right. And, and if I, when I had a hard moment, dealt with it at the time. But instead I, you know, threw all that out the window and, you know, tried to be smart, which I'm not, obviously. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Yeah, smart is overrated. Yeah. So when you're coming back down to Queen Highway on the bike and you're behind... Uh, uh, Lionel at that point yeah there was, you, know, you, you were probably pretty comfortable being right there but then Extre extreme. your heart rate dropped to what? One, 125 and I thought what's he doing? like you know we're so close like we need to keep the gap and you know keep it moving so I just rode up beside him I said to Lionel I said mate we're so close like just keep keep going here you know let's push on just just you know, I'll just go to the front and help with the pacing and I just sort of kept, got the pacing sort of back to something similar to what he'd been riding all day and, and looked back and he was gone. So once that happened, then I, you know, sort of pushed on. I was like, well, I'm not going to wait for you. You know, I've right. already done that all day. Um, I'll <laughs> go off and try and win the race and that was what I tried to do. And so when did uh, w your lack of food and the rest of that, when did that start affecting you in the run? Oh, you, I don't know, probably at the start of it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, it, as I said, it all just sort of went... Yeah, I, I, just, I just wasn't thinking about the right things and I wasn't really... I didn't rehearse where our special needs were. I thought they were a lot closer than they were and so when they were further, it sort of messed with my mind. I was like, oh, where's that bottle? I need that bottle. And, you know, just let things get to me and... Yeah, that was just inexperience, you know, similar to what I dealt with in the, in the swim. And, and it highlights, I mean, I've spent years and years, and it's funny, all these guys ask me, oh, what should I do on the bike, what should I do on the bike? And I think, well, I mean, there's a million, I could tell you every training. In fact, I put every ride on Strava. If anyone wants to follow me on Strava, my name's Goaty McGoatface. Um, <laughs> and every, I do everything on there. So, I mean, people can see it. I don't care if they know. Uh, like, Who go can out, do it? Yeah. Exactly. Go out and copy it. I, go to town. But... Um, I've been, you know, I did six years in the world tour. So start with that. I don't know, Yarn, go and ride in the world tour for six years. Get strong in the bike. Uh, that's uh, an option for you. Um, so I don't, whereas the swim and the run, I'm not confident. You know, like on the bike, I can get myself out of trouble. In the swim, if something goes wrong, I'm vulnerable. If, on the run, when something goes wrong, I'm vulnerable. You know, I've proven that I can swim and I can run. But if something goes wrong, it falls apart. So... Um, yeah, I don't think the, the food was necessarily it. I think it was just everything. Yeah. So when you look at it, you break the bike course record, you go 412. I think Norman Stadler was out there on the course, and uh, that's pretty cool to break his, his record. Um, and you run, run like 319, and on a, on a day figuring that's your sixth Ironman of the year, and 39, I know you weren't happy with 319, you've wanted to be closer to three. What do you think you can do there? What, I mean, yeah, now well, that you've been there as a pro once, what do you think? Well, what happened was I, I was I was sort of still trying until I fell out of fifth. I think McNamee passed me when we got on the Queen K, and just after that I saw Norman Stadler. And he said, you broke my bike course record, you beep, 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 beep. And I was like, I had no idea. And um, I said, oh, mate, I'm, I, sort of, I stopped. He said, what are you doing? I said, oh, don't, I'm so sorry. I mean, I, I didn't, I mean, God, I'm not going to win the race. That's not, I feel bad. Like, I... 
I really feel bad about that because when you did it, you won the event. Right. And um, he said, well, you have to at least finish. I said, oh, mate, don't worry, I'm going to finish, but, you know, I'm not going to win. So, I mean, to me, a world championship, you go there to win. Right. So if you're not going to win, to me, to kill myself to come seventh or eighth or fifth or sixth or... Yeah, who cares? I mean, it, it, I've been to Worlds before and I've won, I've won World Championships. So, you know, I know how great it is to stand there on top of the podium and, and play the national anthem. So I, I just sort of got myself through, you know, the rest of the race. And Norman said, you know, make sure you finish. I was like, of course, I'll finish. So I finished the event. Um, and, yeah, I mean, going forward... Uh, nothing changes. I'm going to try and win. <laughs> so, yeah. What um, you've been obviously working on the running, and you're not going to make the same mistake next year with the swim. So, when I look at next year, you've got potentially Javier Gomez. This year. <laughs> I mean, next yeah. year. Yes, is this year? Yeah. Yeah. You got Javier Gomez, who will probably be there, but from a you know, and he'll be a front pack swim guy. But then also Andrew Starkowitz, and I could potentially see you and Starkey getting away together on the bike, and then potentially. Uh, Sebi and Lionel be behind you guys. Yeah, I mean that's you know this year you know the the guys Sebi and Lionel we were together and normally Lionel hasn't even been in the race, um, so he did really well to improve his swim to be with Sebi and you know and had that support to get himself into that. So if that dynamic changes, you know you'd expect Havi to be up with uh, Amberger, but I mean his bike's going to be pretty vulnerable um, because he's going to want to run fast. And right. That's that's normal. Um, and then, but with Starkowitz, you know, he's proven that he is hell-bent on being the fastest cyclist, which is fantastic. So ideally, yeah, we'll have a similar sort of thing. If I've, if I've got some company, now that I know how much energy you can save just psychologically by just having some, having some company there, you know, even today on the bike, I mean, 360, 370 watts for a couple of hours is like, you know, one of my better sort of efforts. And, and, but having G there, you know, just in front of me, like 15 metres, just psychologically, you, you're just not always thinking about the fact that you're doing that power. So that's a huge advantage. Um, and, um, you know, Dave and I have continued to work hard on my run, and since Kona I've, I've run more than I did before Kona. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really want to go really, really fast there. So, um, And yeah. you, really, at this point, you don't need to do another. You've got enough points, right, to go to Kona. Yeah. But you're going to do probably maybe Oceanside, maybe uh, Ironman Texas. Yeah, I'd really love to do Oceanside, and I'd really love to race Texas. Um, I really want to do Wales again for training. So that it's sort Defending of... Defending champion. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. Um, but, you know, I, I love racing. You know, that's the thing. In cycling, I just used to basically go along and I felt like I was making up the numbers. You know, when I pull on a number, or you don't pull on a number when you stick one on in triathlon, I just want to be at the front. You know, I, I just want to win. I just want to do whatever it takes to get there and then I want to stay there. And um, so, yeah, I really love racing. I really, really, really love every day out there racing. Can you win Kona, do you think? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I really believe I can win Kona and I, and I you know, they, they say the sport's sort of, sort of been dying, you know, recently and so oh, I want to be a part of trying to make it more exciting. I mean, everyone said how exciting it was this year. Yes, um, it was. And, and I mean, I don't, and that's, that was, you know, flattering. I hope I had a part of that. I, you know, one fact I'll, I'll give you is whenever I've, performed pretty well and done a great bike leg or a good sort of race, the course record's broken. So, you know, I think if I can com continue to improve and keep pushing that envelope, we're going to see, you know, more course records broken, particularly in Kona, you know, and well under eight hours, I think, is, is what's going to happen. I mean, there's guys that have run 240. I can't see why I can't run 240. Um, in Kona. Uh, I mean, we're all human. I mean, Kipchoge runs two hours. So it's 40, 40 minutes. It's 40 <laughs> minutes is a huge amount of time slower. So I think that um, I think we're going to see huge improvements in the sport and, and hopefully, you know, much more exciting racing. Um, and, you know, what an amazing event where, you know, gen just anyone can be in the same field at the same time as, you know, the best people, the, in, the world. The best people in the world at that sport. And so um, hopefully I'm a part of, you know, a bit of a wave of, you know, bringing the 
bringing it back to life, you know, and, and making people excited about it again. Love it. How about a round of applause for Mr. Cameron Wolf? That was awesome, man. Thanks. Couple questions from you guys? I think we covered everything. Yes, Roger.